We are live. Awesome. So thank you so much for joining me today. I am joined by the Bob Ost of True Theater Resources Unlimited. So Bob, you and I met, oh my God, when I first moved to the city, which was over 15 years ago. Um, so, and that was when I was working at the Midtown International Theater Festival and True was our fiscal sponsor uh, right. and marketing director. And I became, I became the marketing director for a while, yeah. Yeah, it was a very incestuous relationship. So I've kind, of, so I've seen you and True grow and evolve, and I think it's a really exciting story. So I was going to ask you, as part of your introduction, if you could give us a story of kind of how True came to be. A story. I can give you the story. <laughs> the story, <laughs> yeah. But also make sure you're introducing us to you along the way. Well, first of all, I, I'm Bob Ost. I'm the founder. Um, co-founder of True, along with Cheryl Davis and Gary Hughes. And uh, actually, then we, had, we had another founder at the beginning, Allison Brewster. That's another story. Um, so I'm-, I'm like the fifth Beatle? What? Like the fifth Beatle? Like the fifth Beatle, exactly. She, <laughs> Allison Brewster is our fifth Beatle. Um, so uh, I'm a playwright, composer, lyricist. So I basically, my, my roots are, in, are in, in the art rather than the business of theater. Um, however, uh, my career was in business. My career was in advertising. So art and business were always kind of like competing for my attention uh, since I was probably in my early 20s, which was a long time ago. Um, so <sighs> True came to be, well, we, when we met, by the way, True had already been around for a while. Uh, right. You came, you came a little a little later because you're a young Right. Star. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, but so it was about 27 years ago. Is, so yeah, it was about 20, so, 92, I think. As a writer, a playwright, composer, lyricist, I was, uh, I was setting my stuff around, and uh, I was getting uh, finalist status in a bunch of competitions and getting nice letters, and I was a se semi-finalist at the O'Neill twice. And but I wasn't getting produced, and I thought, well, isn't that isn't this odd? Shouldn't I be getting produced if I'm as good as they say? Um, so uh, I gave it some thought, and I decided that the reason why uh, I wasn't getting produced was because I didn't know producers. And I thought, well, maybe networking is a, is a part of the puzzle that's missing for me. So, so I started hanging out with theater companies, like a couple small theater companies that I knew, and much to my um, amazement, I discovered how difficult it was to make theater happen. And these people that were the uh, artistic directors of these little theater companies were having a hell of a time making theater happen and getting the money together and getting the resources together and putting in all the pieces together. And after a couple months of my watching their frustration and also their inability to produce me, um, I uh, decided to invite them all to my apartment and see whether they could help each other and maybe somebody would have a piece of the puzzle that the other person's missing and they'll get together and work and miracles will happen, yay. Um, so I invited three people, I knew three theater companies that I was sort of hanging out with. And I also invited um, a couple of uh, other friends. I, our co-founder Cheryl Davis asked if she could invite some people. The people that we invited asked if they could invite a couple of pieces of people and I wound up with 30 people in my apartment. Luckily, I had a living room that could just about handle 30 people, 30 bodies in that room. And everybody was like so excited and talking about how much trouble they were having making theater happen. And people were hearing other people talk about the challenges and, and some of the successes, but mostly the challenges. And I noticed that people were sort of healing. They were, hear they were hearing that other people were going through what they were going through, and it was very therapeutic, and it was actually kind of moving um, to, to see people light up and find out that they were not the only crazy people doing what they were trying to do. Mm. So wow. changing, you know, that you, you talk about it, your, your thing is another way. So this was, this was my another way. Uh, wow. Textbook. I love it. I basically, I was not getting produced, so I wanted to find another way to get produced. Well, the path doesn't always lead where you think it's going to lead. So it didn't necessarily lead to my getting produced. Although I must say over the years, I've had substantial 
showcases of my one acts and a little place here and there. I've gotten things produced around the, uh, here and there. And also before I before I actually started true, I had an off Broadway show. I yeah, had uh, where? Uh, it was a place called the Actors Playhouse. If you know, uh, at Bleecker okay. Street, not Bleecker Street, Seventh yeah. Avenue, and uh, around Christopher. Okay. Uh, from it. Where's the Actors Playhouse? I don't remember now. It's not there now. There's something's there, but it's not called the Actors. I've heard of it. Yeah. Okay. So I, I had a musical re review. It was an off-Broadway show. It's called Everybody's Getting Into the Act, and uh, it had a short, short but but lovely and memorable run. At the Actors Playhouse. Nice. Um, and uh, I got a bad review from John Simon, and I went into hiding for about two years. <laughs> well, that's a very common story for writers. Yeah. Uh, oh, he was he was brutal. He was brutal. Um, a few nicer things were said in the Times, and a few nicer things were said in smaller publications. But John Simon stuck with me for two years. Mm, of course. So right. the other the another way for me was uh, I'm not getting produced with what I'm doing, I'm not meeting my goals by doing what I'm doing. So uh, I thought of another way of doing things. Um, right, and, and maybe instead of getting produced, you kind of learned how to produce yourself, which I also love. Well, that's the other part of the, part of the story for me. Yeah. That uh, I had, even in the business world, I was an advertising copywriter. So I was what they always refer to as a creative. So I, um, I I wrote copy, uh, but uh, I got lured away from re retail. I was with Macy's, I was with the Bloomingdale's. I was I was the fashion writer for the three people out there who have ever heard of it for a, a place called Bonwit Teller, which was one of the biggest fashion stores in New York for women. It was it was a major store, and you know, Trump uh, tore it down and built Trump Tower there. That's wow. where that used to be about Bonham and Teller. Sad, 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 sad story. So um, I was, what was I saying? <laughs> uh, that you became a producer yourself. I was lured away from retail into a small advertising agency that specialized in fashion and fragrance. Uh, I, I was also, uh, I've also been the copy director at Revlon. Um, so I was lured away and for a year, I, I, I was very happy as the creative director of this small company. And then one of the two partners decided he didn't want to do it anymore. And he pulled out. And the other partner ran to me in a panic and said, can you help me run this company? I'm thinking, run the company? I'm a writer. And then I thought, well, somebody's got to do it. So, so I took it on and I learned how to run a business. I spent four years running an advertising agency and I suddenly couldn't hide behind the, oh, I'm an artist. I don't know anything about business. <laughs> so, That's art meets biz. Yeah, it was art meets art. <laughs> yeah, it crashes into business. Yeah. yeah. So um, I took that with me into my theater career and decided that, well, geez, if I can run a business, maybe I can produce an evening of my work. Why not? Yeah. So I raised some money, which was like, oh, my God, I raised money. Um, and I put the pieces together. I hired a cast and a uh, director and music director. And we I, we did a show of mine that I produced called Love and Laughter. It was a cabaret review. Nobody's ever heard of it but me and my, and my family. Um, and um, from there, I, I realized that I mean, I'm, actually I made, I, I made enough money to pay back most of the the money that the people had given me, even though they weren't expecting to get it back, but oh, nice. I, I wanted I wanted to give it back. I wanted I, you know, if I made a little money, I wanted them to have it. Um, so so uh, I was sort of putting all of these pieces together when I started uh, pull, pulling people together in my living room for True, and I decided that it was important and worthwhile for artists to learn how to be businessmen. Um, it's as, as important as, as it is for the producers to understand art, uh, artists need to understand business. So that's why that's why I do True, that's that's why, what I do. Now, I 27, 28 years, whatever it is. 
I know it's incredible. And so let me ask you this, this is the big question. And uh, when you were putting together your shows and true as well, so I guess this is two questions in one. Um, what were your end goals? Like, for instance, were you thinking, oh, I want to be on Broadway. Oh, my show was going to go to Broadway. I want my, or what were you, where did direction did you think you were going in? Or did you even have a direction? I have to say that through going through the experiences as a, as a writer in, in New York, as a playwright in New York, uh, I always secretly clung to the idea of winning a Tony Award and I had my speech already. No. I also realized that there are other goals. Uh, and the goal that I committed to when I was, even before I started True, was I wanted to find the audience that would appreciate what I do. Mm. So for me, it was about sharing. I wanted to share my art. I wanted to share my heart. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm a pretty honest writer. I'm a little brutally honest at times. And I, I, I'm very, um, I write things that surprise me sometimes. Um, I try to be true. That's true. True. Yeah. yeah. Or again, true. Yeah. Uh, so I, this is a little, this is hard. I, it was disappointing to let go of the dreams. I don't think I ever let go of the dreams, but I recognize the dreams as being dreams rather than goals that I knew how to pursue. Uh, I don't know how you pursue a career as a writer to get to Broadway other than be, being as good as you can be and being as honest you can, as you can be, but also meeting the right people helps. Um, marketing yourself is, is that's the other thing. I'm I'm very I'm good at marketing other people. I'm not as good at marketing myself. Right. So here I am at age, and um, I still haven't had a Broadway show. I still haven't worked with Tony. Well, I think I think what happens is goals evolve, or and I think that the key that when I'm working with artists in development, I always say you have to be open to change and evolution, and as long as you're being authentic to why you are creating your art, then you will naturally evolve with it. And I think that's actually what you have done beautifully, is that you've always uh, worked from your heart. Even your the work you put into True is very much um, from your heart. You still have, you still let, I think this is your signature, you still let everyone introduce themselves, even at the very first True meeting that I went to post pandemic, you know, there was like 50, 60 people in that room and they all got their elevator pitch introduction, as I call it, the elevator pitch. But that's so you and it's what's important to you. And I think that authenticity is how your goals have kind of evolved as led your your way. And it's why you're successful and why True 20 some late years later is still thriving. So, I mean, congratulations to you on that, really. <laughs> Well, for me, I think the word is community. Um, from, yes. the first, from the first time that I put, brought people together in a room in, in my, my apartment, um, community became a, a goal for me, became, became a, a purpose for me. Mm. So I'm always trying to create community. And now with all of us in isolation, uh, it couldn't be more important than, it, than ever. Uh, people sitting at home by themselves, um, I'm not a re I don't jump into technology really fast. I sort of ease my way into it, but I got to say, what? But you've done it. I've done you're it. Hesitant, but you've definitely done it. Well, when when the lockdown started on, I guess it was May 16th. Um, no, not May 16th. You mean March? Know, March 16th. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. March, May. Oh. It's all blurring together now. I know. <laughs> Who knows what day it is now? I know. So when that happened, I was thrown into a, a panic and, 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 and acknowledge, I'll acknowledge it was a form of despair about what we were going to do. Um, I, I had to shut down all of my live programming for True. Right. And um, after about two weeks of searching my soul, um, I committed to doing the panels that I had planned um, virtually, which is not that big a jump. I mean, it's it's very easy to do a panel. Doing a performance, doing a play is a little harder, but we're learning how to do that. Doing a panel, it's one person speaking at a time. Yeah. So Zoom is a Zoom or, or Be Live or whatever, whoever, whoever we're promoting at the moment. Um, yeah. 
offers opportunities for us to do uh, programming and th that's meaningful and sharing knowledge and sharing our experiences with each other uh, via the, the internet. Um, so after about two weeks of soul searching, I decided to jump in and community is exactly what I thought was needed right now. So I created the true community gathering, which is every Friday at 4.30 uh, on Zoom. And uh, if people want to join every week, we're, we're talking about making art in the, in the time of COVID. Um, the co the, it covers a lot of different aspects of it. We've done marketing, we've done being a director. We haven't really specifically had a panel about how an actor adapts to uh, to uh, performing in isolation. But I think that would be an interesting topic as well. Yeah. And you're going to be help, you're going to be with me on Friday talking about uh, the various platforms, yes. which ones offer what, how much they cost, and what's better for what. And, you know, we're all we're all figuring this out. We're all, we're all in this together. Hashtag. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And and it is. A, um, a, I know there's been the big topic. Part of the reason why I'm doing this presentation, which was a lot of research, by the way, of all these different platforms, and trying. I'm also trying to just catch up with, you know, the technology that's available uh, for online events, streaming events. But I know that that's been a really big topic. Um, in the community as far as how can we move our theater online and virt and make it virtual and stream it and, and all these different suggestions. What would you, as someone who's really in touch with the theater community specifically, what would you say is um, on everybody's minds right now? Like what is the big buzz about the pand you know, specifically related to how to adjust to the pandemic? What is it that people are talking about and concerned about? Oh, there's obviously a lot of topics that are being talked about first i mean first and foremost is when are we going to be able to have live performance again and right. i think we've we've all agreed that um it, it wasn't going to happen as fast as uh, some of the politicians have, have said said it would um i don't think it's going to happen september 1st e either right. uh, i don't think people are going to be um comfortable uh, interacting and being in a room crowded room together with a thousand of their close nearest and dearest um, until we have, until we have a vaccine, until we have some handle on what coronavirus is and how it, how it, um, how to keep it at bay, at least. Um, I think that the, the story right now with the virus is e even with a, even with a vaccine, it's not going to prevent people from getting it, but I think it's going to, they're going to find ways of making it more manageable. That's not going to be as, as deadly. Um, once we have a, con a confidence level that it's not going to be as deadly, um, I think people will start coming back into the theater. I know that theater is talking about uh, socially distancing within the theater or at least having people be required to wear masks in the theater. Ugh. I know. That's yeah. what I say. I wear, I wear glasses. I don't wear. I'm I'm nearsighted, so so yeah. looking at you on a screen, I have to, I don't wear my glasses. But I don't. I, if I if I had to go to theater and wear a mask, I would be seeing the entire thing through a fog with my glasses. Right. My glasses just fog up. So, but you know what? We adjust. Yeah, we'll adjust. Life call hands us things. I mean, the the job description for life. Is solving problems. Mm, nice. Solving problems. That's what it's all about. That's what we're here to do. We're also here to learn about love. That's another thing. That's another discussion. Mm. But one hundred percent, I agree. We we'll find way. We'll find another way mm -hmm. of of having theater, and eventually we'll get back to what theater used to be. We're eventually going to get back to the old normal, but it's a big mistake for people to rush into this and try to pretend it's all gonna go away and that we can go back to something closer to normal now as much as we really, really want it. Agreed. Just think about what do we really, really want more, like maybe staying healthy and staying alive. Right. There, you gotta really check out your priorities. Check your heart, check your priorities. Yeah, absolutely. And, but, and people are like are doing Zoom readings. Uh, so p some theater I'm people, yeah, yeah, have kind of started doing online a little bit. So what we're what a lot of the buzz is about is uh, virtual presentations. Uh, we're learning uh, little by little what what works, what works better. Uh, we're learning 
to use virtual backgrounds uh, so that all of the actors look like they're in the same place. Uh, people are beginning to understand that they can actually use props a little bit. Maybe maybe you want to dress a little bit more appropriately for your character just to give give the, the viewer something that makes the experience closer to a live presentation. Um, and acting is different. Uh, people have to really embrace the fact that the acting for theater and the acting for virtual presentation are, are different. Uh, this is a very this is a close up medium. Um, right. I guess you can you can set yourself farther from the camera or closer to the camera, but in general, the focus is really on your face. So you have to be very careful. You can't you can't overdo it. You can't underdo it. Um, Right. And also so much of any performing is the energy that you feel between the interactions on stage and even with the audience, feeling the energy of the audience. And now that that's not there, it is it would be an interesting panel to talk about that, actually, because I do think that's totally different now. How do we recreate the, the energy and feeling of a live performance in a virtual presentation? Yes. Oh, that's a great title. So we're going to do that a week the week after yours. We're going to do okay, it. Okay, great. Yeah, and if anyone watching is interested, this Friday at four thirty, um, email either Bob or I, or reach out through the Facebook page, my Facebook page, um, because I am going to be talking about how to do different, all the different tools that are available as far as virtual backgrounds go, and sound um, technologies and ways to kind of integrate and make a really unique uh, presentation, not just a um, a show versus just a presentation, you know, like what businesses do. So the um, one thing that we haven't tackled or that t technology hasn't tackled yet uh, that I know about is the ability to, to place the frames uh, on the screen in a way that you want them to be. So you can't get your actors necessarily framed uh, right. the way you want them to be, but. Well, you can do that with some of the platforms. You can actually uh, place the frames yeah, actually, Twitch lets you do that, but I wouldn't recommend Twitch for theater artists. Wow. But yeah, that's a huge. That's huge. Zoom has got to do that. Zoom has got got to bring that into the technology. Right now, what we can do is uh, we can have all of the audience uh, turn off their audio and their video, so that so that uh, you can't see them, and then you click something called hide non-video participants. So the only people that become visible are your actors. And the actors will have to learn how to turn off their video when they make an exit and turn on their video when they make an entrance. So there's a whole new set of rules that we're- Yeah, there are rules. And it requires rehearse, rehearsing. So. And it requires rehearsals, yeah. yeah. The rehearsals are a little different now that we're in, in virtual world. Right. Um, so to, just to change the topic slightly, I'm curious to ask you, because I feel like this is what everyone really wants to know, is how has theater really changed throughout the time that you've been doing True, which is or how long you've been in New York, which is even longer than the 90s, I think. Um, and, and not just, like, we all know what's happening with how it's changed since the pandemic. We were just talking about that. But I mean theater really as an art form, uh, which I think has really evolved since the 90s. So do you want to speak to what, those changes that you've seen? Well, a lot of things have happened. It, it, theater's become more and more uh, uh, expensive to produce. Um, and so um, what, what we've seen is the decline in, in Off-Broadway. Off-Broadway used to be the incubation for, for new work. Yeah. For new work. Off-Broadway is becoming uh, less and less um, viable uh, for, uh, unless you're a not-for-profit. Um, if you want to uh, produce your work uh, in, in uh, association with a not-for-profit, you can do that. You can, you can, you can partner with them. But not off Broadway. I think that's the biggest change, um, and also the development of off off Broadway. The, 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 what we call off off Broadway, but I think we've, we've been trying for years to rebrand as as indie theater. Yeah, uh, I think it's starting to stick. I think indie theater is important. Agreed. Uh, uh, a lot of the incubation incubation of new work is happening in regionals now. Uh, it's taken over. It's taken a lot away from the off Broadway, but off Broadway. It's, I I want to find another way for off Broadway. I really well, I think to be honest, I think that's what indie theater has now become. It's become the developmental arena for theater um, in some ways. I mean, there is no direct translation of what off Broadway used to be. 
But I think that at least in New York, that's what people are using it for because it's cheaper than off Broadway. Off -Broadway yeah. This heads into the area of, of what is commercial theater um, and what is what is indie well, theater because in, indie theater has embraces a lot of the non traditional works, uh, things that things that you would not expect to pop up on Broadway, things that you would not expect to have a commercial production. Commercial production, to that's me, true. if I may de define it, is the ability to sell thousands of tickets uh, eight days a week for enough time to actually make money off of what you're doing. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's really audience, it's, it's about the, the big audience. Um, not everything is, is meant for a, for a large audience. Not everything is meant for the commercial audience. There's a lot of flexibility. There's a lot of different levels of art within our art. And people, I, what I always say is, I mean, I, I may not like what you produce, but I'll fight your, to your death your right to produce it. Um, nice. So there's lots of there's lots of different there's lots of there's lots of other ways of creating theater. Uh, Hamilton at one point would we would have never considered uh, possible as as being a commercial work. So our, our idea of what commercial is has sort of shifted as well. Fun Home. There's a show that I never thought would would have worked commercially. And yet it's, it's 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 surviving. It's thriving. Actually, it's it's not it's not a big hit like Hamilton, but it's it's doing well and on tour, and it's a gorgeous show. Um, yeah. So I, that goes back to the Tony Award versus the, the the practical goal. The practical goal is finding the audience that appreciates what you do. Yes. Whatever. And and also, I would say just to take it a step further, not defining that audience in terms of size. No, just, just no. finding it as in who likes it. And if it ends up being, I think that's like how Hamilton was able to kind of rise because, you know, they had, they knew their audience or not Hamilton actually in the Heights would probably be a better example. They okay. knew their audience and it just so happened to grow to Broadway. Nobody thought that audience would support Broadway, you know, but it did. So I think that's also important. Well, I think that if we write something, uh, audiences come to see it and, and are moved, inspired, or changed, even if it's only a uh, ten people, or thirty people, or a hundred people. I right. think I think there's something valid that's valuable in that. There's, it's a it's a purpose worth pursuing. Uh, all that's to all writers out there, and to myself, because uh, after we get off this call today, I'm going to go back to a play that I've been working on. Um, I'm in fifty, so I've actually made real headway on it. So it's going to be it's going to be a full length play. Um, and again, I don't know whether it's going to be a Broadway play or an off Broadway play. I don't know. I don't know where it's going to be. I just hope that it will be performed somewhere, and that people will enjoy it, and people will be moved and possibly changed or inspired. So, Fantastic. That, those are those are other goals other than winning a Tony Award. Yeah, I love it. And actually, we're just about out of time. And that was my last question, anyways. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about your artistic? projects that you're working on? Uh, I'm, I'm a playwright, composer, lyricist, and um, over the years, my output has not been as much as it could have been because I've spent so much time running true and so much time in, in advertising, so I really had split focus. But I've written uh, several full-length plays. That a lot of them have won awards. I won a, I wrote a full-length musical that won, a, won an award, a couple awards, uh, and uh, the off-Broadway play, uh, off-Broadway show, which was a musical review. So I, I write a lot of different things. I write plays, I write musicals, I write musical reviews. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know. I think that I think that the thing that ties all my stuff together, uh, a couple things, is um, I love you know I love the craft of writing. And I think that my my work is well crafted. I think that it's honest. And I think that it deals with themes that matter to me and hopefully will matter to other people. Um, and the play that I'm working on right now is a coming of age story, a gay coming of age story that takes place in the 70s, late 70s. And um, I've, I write about where I've been. I mean, I have a musical of mine called Angel in My Heart, which, which was done in 2014. And, that was that was really taken right from my life. So it's a, it's as honest as it could be. I saw it. Big fan. I thought it was very well done. Thank you. Yeah. I did book music and lyrics for that. I do not advise people to do book music and lyrics ever. But it's a lot of work. 
<laughs> I mean, when you're actually in rehearsals and you're the book writer, the, the yeah, both are in the lyricist. Which one of you is for, are, are, can you focus in, in rehearsals? I mean, you, which hat are you wearing at what time? Yeah, you can't you can't really effectively do all three. I told the the, the director before we went into rehearsals that I wanted to focus on the music because I scored it for piano, cello, and um, and flute. And I wanted to actually hear the music um, performed and see if it was working. And I learned that I overwrote for flute, so I have to connect, mm -hmm. thin, thin some of that out. Um, I learned a lot of stuff from from it. It's, it's it's always it's not all about Tony Awards. It's not necessarily about making a living. Although it would be lovely if we could all make a living from our art. Um, some of it's about just going through our experiences, sharing, expressing, communicating, um, being honest learning about the world, sharing what we know about the world, and sharing what we know about ourselves. Nice. Oh, that's beautiful, Bob. Thank you so much. This was definitely long overdue, I think, for us to have this chat. So I really appreciate you making the time to come and talk about your Another Way. And keep doing what you're doing. I will see you on Friday at True. And we're looking forward to see what True does next. So. Oh, we have a, a play reading series, a virtual play reading series, oh, 14th and June yeah. 17th. So um, people should uh, go to trueonline, tru-online.org to learn about what we're up to and become part of the community. I invite you all to be part of us. We, yep. We'd love to have you. Good. I just put the link in the uh, comments, and I'll also make sure it goes into the YouTube video. Follow uh, uh, this, YouTube, this video will be posted on YouTube at TSGO Prods. And uh, we'll see you all later. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Bye. Pleasure to be here. Thank you.